This morning, the scripture reading will come from Acts chapter 19, verses, let's see, sorry, Acts chapter 18, verses 13 through 20. 19? Here it is. 19, 13 through 20. Then some of the illiterate Jews, exorcists, took on themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exercise you by the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also there were seven sons of Sekva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was, was leaped on them and overpowered them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This became known to both both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came, confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of them who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it was totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Right. We appreciate that so very much. Uh, we're glad to be here. We've been coming here since 1981, really, and uh, I think the little bit of building next door was, was here and uh, at Center Point Road Church, and the Carrollton changed a good bit over the years, and we've changed with it. I was taking a nap the other day, and uh, my wife woke me up and said, uh, we got to leave in a few minutes, said, uh, you going to shampoo your hair? And I said, I've got hair. And uh, it's, uh, so we, we change, you know, a little bit. Time goes on. It's good to see each one of you. Of course, uh, Helen and Glenn are special to us. We've kept up with them since uh, late 60s, and it's always good to see them spend some time with them. And I've got uh, my wife, Daisy, here, and my daughter, Tina Dickinson Shepherd. She's here, and my son, uh, Andy Dickinson, and my grandson, Drew Dickinson's here, and we're just uh, having a good time being in Carrollton, Georgia, so... We appreciate and love each one of you. Young man did a great job reading the scripture there, and I, I don't blame him. You know, he he looked at that verse and he said, "This couldn't be it. It must be chapter 18." But this is it. This is our text. You know, Acts 19, 13 through 20. Certain vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, uh, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of one Seba, a Jew, chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This was known to all the Jews and the Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified Many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. And many also, which used curious hearts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. They counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. But I think about uh, this 
man in whom the evil spirit was leaping on them. Whoo, can you imagine? Boy, we've, we've uh, done the wrong thing here. These fellows thought that they could uh, deceive the people and get some gain out of them. But none of them were Jesus. None of them were Paul. They were not apostles. They were not inspired people. They had neither part nor lot in the matter, and they found that out. It kind of reminds me of the story about the boxer, you know. Old Lewis Stryker told this story. He said the boxer had a new manager. This new manager would psych up his fighters, you know, and, and uh, he had a different approach. Well, they, they came to the boxing match, and he sent the fighter out, you know, to fight the first round. He came back to the stool after the round was over. And that manager said, he never laid a glove on you. He never laid a glove on you. So he sent him out there for the second round. He came back. The guy sat down on the stool, and the manager said, he never laid a glove on you. He never laid a glove on you. Boxer looked up at him and said, you better check the referee out. Somebody whooping the tar out of me. So, you know, <laughs> that's what happened to these guys here. That evil spirit whooped the tar out of them. They left the building. Jesus, I know. Paul, I know, but who are you? Well, that's what we want to talk about. Who are you? And I said, we, we, need to, we need to think about who we really are and look deep within ourselves. And I said, where can I find a passage in the Bible that says, who are you? Are you who you should be? Well, these people were not. Some people go through life as spectators. They deceive themselves. James 1.26, if any man among you seem to be religious but browdeth not his tongue and deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Self-deception is a bad thing, isn't it? But we can deceive ourselves. We can uh, think of ourselves as being something that we're not. We can try to pass ourselves off as something we're not. It's been said that if a man's reputation met his character on the street, they might not even know one another. We need to have character. We really do. We need to build character. And the reputation will take care of itself. What people think about us will take care of itself if we concentrate on us. But people fail to do that. They can see everything about others. They can tell what's wrong with other people. Spectators in life, we can't afford to do that. We've got to be sure of it. We've got to make it as sure as possible. Now you just think about that, how important that is. You think about what we need to do, and I want to use the acrostic, you know. Y-O-U. Who are you? But you need, you need an identity, and you need that identity fixed in your mind as to what it really is. Matthew 16, 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, said, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they answered and said, Some say thou art John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus said, But whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you say, Why did people have trouble with the identity of Jesus? Well, it's very simple. Very simple. John 9, 22 the Jews agreed already that if any did confess that he was a Christ, they should be put out of the synagogue. John 12, 42 and 43, among the chief rulers, many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess him lest they be put out of the synagogue for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So it would be a serious thing to say, 
this is the Christ. This is a Messiah. This is, this is the Son of God. That would be a tough thing to do in front of these Pharisees. So some said, we honor Christ, so we'll say he's a prophet. We honor him, but we'll say he, he has the spirit and power of Elijah like John the Baptist. Or surely he's a prophet of God. But see, that was their way of getting around saying who he really was with some of them. Sometimes we try to get around identifying ourselves in our own mind because we don't like what we see. You know, the hardest thing to get a person to do is realize who their number one enemy in the world is. Your number one enemy. You could ask a person, who's your number one enemy? And this boxer would say, the champion. You could say, who's your number one enemy? And this guy might say, my neighbor across the street. <laughs> the Bible says, love your enemies, love your neighbors. Sometimes they're the same folk. So, you know, he said, my enemy across the street, say, my neighbor. You know who your worst enemy is? All you got to do is find you a mirror, you're looking right at him. That's the person you're going to have problems with. That's the person you need to be concerned about. That's the person that's going to do you in, the fellow you're looking at in the mirror. Nobody can change him but you. Now, you just think about that. I can strive to be a better husband. I can work to be a better father. I can make every effort to be a better neighbor. But I can't change other people. I can't change my wife. She'll have to change on her own. I can't change my son, my daughter, my grandchildren. They'll have to change their life. Now I can influence them. I can set the right example. But the only person that can change you is you. It's true. It's true. Now let the letter Y in you stand for yesterday. We're talking about the past. Yesterday. Psalms 90, verse 9, we spend our years as a tale that is told. We're told in Psalm 90, verse 12, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. But sometimes, you know, we make all sorts of mistakes, and then we can look back to yesterday, and sometimes we can dwell on those mistakes. Those mistakes will keep us beat down. We've got to overcome the past. Paul talked about it. Philippians 3.13, he said, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. You, get, you have to forget about the mistakes you made in the past. you got to. Now I preached a sermon, and right after the uh, services were over that uh, that that Sunday, we had a fellowship meal, and so I'm in the fellowship hall, and I sat down over there, you know, with with a couple of plates, and uh, so these two ladies come over to my table, and uh, they said, "Can we sit down here and talk to you?" I said, "Yes." You know, yeah. You know, I said, that'd help me digest my food. Two good-looking women sitting across from me. So they sat down there, you know, to talk. And uh, one of them said, well, John, I need to talk to you. He said, uh, I'm thinking about being baptized, but my life is a mess. My life is a disaster. My life is in shambles, she said. She said, I just don't know that I'm a candidate for baptism. And I said, well, I said, you believe the truth? I said, you know, the Bible tells us, uh, Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Do you believe the truth? And she said, yes, I believe the truth. I, I believe the gospel, you know. 
I said, do you believe that Christ died for your sins on the cross? She said, yes. And I said, are you willing to turn away from sin and repentance and make the confession that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Are you willing to do that? She said, yes. I said, well, you're a candidate for baptism. She said, well, what am I going to do about all that mess I've made of my life? I said, it's not for you to handle. She said, what? I said, it's not for you to handle. And she said, no, you got this messed up. I said, no, you got it messed up. I said, what did Saul make a mess of his life? He was a Pharisee. He was persecuting the church. Read Acts 8, verse 3. He made havoc of the church. He did everything that he, he was fighting against the Lord, and he didn't even know it. He thought he was doing the right. He made a shambles of his life. And what did the man tell him? Acts 22, verse 16. Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. Wash away thy sin. I said, you can wash it all the way, the mess you made of your life. Call it on the name of the Lord. She couldn't believe it. She said, it's that simple. I said, it's that simple. The lady sitting next to her said, well, I've been baptized in the Christ. I knew what I was doing. I was baptized right here at this congregation. And she said, but she said, I've made a mess of my life. Since I obeyed the gospel, what am I going to do? I said, you're going to make a public confession. That's what you're going to do. Because I, I'm sitting right here telling you that you sure do need to make one. <laughs> I mean, I know you, you know. And I said, James 5, 16. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, about you need the prayers of the congregation. I mean, it, it's true. And there are people out there that will have all against you, and you, you, need to, you need to clear it up. Well, you know what happened? This lady was baptized into Christ, and the others made a public confession. It was just that simple. It wasn't anything I did. They came to me and asked me, and I just told them what the Scripture said. And I took care of it yesterday, the past. What are we going to do from here on? We're going to try to build a lie. See. We've got to build a lie. But you just think about James chapter 1, verse 21. We've got to receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. But be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. If any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, like unto a man that beholdeth his natural face in the glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway or immediately forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but doer the work, this man should be blessed in his deed. For life is short. You know. It is. Job chapter 9, verse 25. Job said, my life is swifter than the post. You know what a post is. That's, that's a carry of messages from one city to the other. This fellow here, he would, he would take that message and he'd shag out to the next city. And he's moving as fast as he can move. He's got to carry the news. Our lives are swifter than that. Our days are swifter than the post. We need to take care of it. And let the letter O and the Word U stands for obstacles. Had a good friend of mine by the name of Bill Otto. He and I worked together, worked side by side. And old Bill said one day, he said, let's go fishing. I said, all right, you want to go right now? He said, no, I mean, after we get off work. I said, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. You know. So we planned a fishing trip, and uh, we went down on the river fishing and just had the best time, you know, and, Old Bill said, I want to talk to you. You're a preacher, right? I said, I've been accused of it. And he says, uh, I want to ask you a question. He said, uh, don't you think life is getting over one obstacle after another? I said, Bill, there's more to life than that. But you do have to take care of the obstacles. 
Then that's what I want to talk to you about just for a minute. The obstacles. How are you going to take care of them? We're talking about your, your present. What what you do today? And we have to remember verses like 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 2 Peter 1 and 3, according as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, whereby given us exceeding great precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through love. And beside this, giving it all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge patience, to patience temperance, godliness, brother kindness, love. He says add all these Christian graces. And he tells us, if you do these things, you should never fall. And in verse 11, entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How are you going to get over these obstacles? If if you've got something, I mean, I, I've been in the woods on a four-wheeler, and there'd be a log sitting there, and I said, I have got to get over there, and i got to get back, and I don't want to tear my four-wheeler up. And I have stacked stuff up and then gone over the pile. And I said, boy, that worked pretty good. And got back over the pile. That's the way you overcome obstacles. You've got to have your faith as a foundation. Add to your faith virtue. And you've got to add all these other, and you can build a bridge. You can build a bridge. I, you talk about building the bridge. This fellow was walking down the beach, you know, there in California, and he stumbled over a little thing there, and he picked it up, and there's a lantern, and he rubbed it, and a genie jumped out. And he said, I get three wishes. The genie said, no, 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 you get one. And he said, what are the three wishes? He said, that's storybook stuff. I'm a real genie. You get one wish. And he says, all right, I'll take one wish. And he said, what's your wish? He said, mm, I always wanted to go to Hawaii. I've never been. He said, I want you to, he said, my house is right over there off the beach. I want you to build me a bridge from here to Hawaii. And when I get ready to go, I can get on that bridge and go. The genius says, whoo, Man, that'll take every bit of the power I ever had. Take me years to get my power built back up. Can't you think of something, something that that I could do for you that would be less strenuous for me? And he said, just think of something. The guy thought for a minute. He said, okay, I want you to wave your magic wand and, and enable me to be able to understand my why. The genie looked at it and said, you want that bridge two lane or four lane? <laughs> you say that's, that's some obstacle just too hard to overcome. Well, you can do it. You can do it. You've got to be willing to make effort, you know. Ecclesiastes 9 and 10, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. You know, you got to put something into it. You can overcome obstacles with the Lord's help. Psalms 121, verse 1, I will lift up mine eyes under the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. So there's nothing that the Lord can't overcome for you. We can't overcome. Now, let's talk about the future. Let the letter U stand for use your assets and you've got plenty of them the way you talk colossians 4 and 6 let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man you've got to do that you've you've got to think about what you say proverbs 25 verse 11 a word fitly spoken like apples of gold in pictures 
of silver. You've got to say the right thing. You've got to try to influence people correctly. And you, you can do it. You can say the right thing. You can control your speech. That's so important. What about the way that you live? Matthew 5, 13, you're the salt of the earth. If the salt had lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It's henceforth good for nothing to be cast out, trodden under foot of men. You're the light of the world. A city that sit on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. They give it light to all that are in the house. Even so, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You've got to set the example. It, this is something you can do. You've got to be sure that you're faithful in your attendance to the church. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another. You see, we've got to encourage one another. We've got to encourage one another. You've got to be able to say, well, we've got an excellent preacher at Dave. We need to support him. He gets up and teaches, and we're not there to hear him. That's a shame because we need to support him. You know, he's precious to us. We need to support him. We need to pray for him every night. And matter of fact, we need to pray for the church here at uh, Carrollton every night. I mean, West Georgia Church should be first and foremost in our mind. It's got to be. Because if, if everybody did like I do, what would happen to the congregation? So you, you've got to have responsibility about it. You've got to use your assets. And you don't have to be rich. You know, just whatever you have, you put it to the Lord's use. Your time, your resources, those things that the Lord has blessed you with. Because we've got to use things to the glory of God. Now, you just think about it. You can't live in yesterday. you got to put that behind you. You can't let obstacles stop you. You've got to live day by day overcoming obstacles with the help of the good Lord. And you've got to use your assets for the glory of God in order for anybody around you to have a future. That's the, that's the work of the future, using everything you have to glorify God. My good friend Leslie G. Thomas wrote a poem and he said, if you search for kindness, be kind. If you search for truthfulness, be true. What you look for in other people, you will find. And you'll find your life is a reflection of you. Now, you think about the word of that poet. We look at other people. There's good in people. Of course, there's some bad in people, too. We don't want to take the bad. We want to take the good. Matter of fact, there was a fella by the name of Truslow Adams that had this to say. He said, there is so much good in the worst of us and so much bad in the best of us. It would ill behoove any of us to find fault with the rest of us. Now, you think about that. We find what we look for in life. We've got to look for the Lord. We've got to live for him. You think about it. If you're in a way subject to heaven's invitation, please come while we stand together and sing.